1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4. Uh, we'll be there in just a moment. Today we begin a series called Love One Another or One Another Christianity. And today I'll kick that off by talking about how we should love one another. Over the course of the next few weeks, we'll notice that flowing out of our love for one another will be other ways that we can respond to each other uh, in the Christian faith. So as we begin this series, I thought you'd want to know that there are about a hundred references to one another in the New Testament. And uh, what we'll discover is about 60 of those are located outside of the Gospels. The word in the Greek for one another is alelon. Almost sounds like all alone, but it means exactly the opposite of that. It means all together, uh, as uh, being with one another. And so what I wanted us to understand is we'll be talking about, over the course of the next few weeks, what is our responsibility to each other? Uh, Scott Tillman, the bionic man, did a good job this morning of talking to us about how we have a responsibility and a relationship with each other. That we live in community with each other. So we have a responsibility to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to mourn with those who are mourning and to step in and help when we find other people who are going through hard times. And so this series will help us as we think about what is our responsibility to one another. And here you'll see that there are uh, 47 uses of this word uh, that are specifically given to followers of Jesus Christ. This is what you should do because of your commitment to Christ for one another. And you'll notice a large percentage of these come from the Apostle Paul. And I find that a little bit interesting because when we were studying Romans, I kept trying to say to you, Paul's the intellectual. He's the first great theologian of the church. He lives way up here quite a bit of the time. But he often would say, after looking up here, the implication of this is this is how you should treat one another. So all of this up here should tell us that we have a responsibility and an obligation to one another. This morning, I think you'll notice that about a third of the one another passages at least deal specifically with attributes of love, of how we should treat each other in love. But I'll argue over the next few weeks that if you get this one right, love one another, all the other one another passages that we'll talk about will flow out of this one. So get this one right and you're good. Okay? Get this one right and you're good. Now, before I move into the sermon today, I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them something because about hmm, 20 minutes from now, you're going to say these words to the person next to you. And I thought you'd just want to know that I knew that you were going to say these words to the person next to you. So I'm going to give them to you now. Are you ready? The words you're you need to say to the person next to you is I wish the Apostle John had preached this sermon instead of Sager. Okay, tell that to the person next to you. I wish the Apostle John had preached this sermon instead of Sager. Okay, great. In about 20 minutes, this will make perfect sense to you. Okay, if you're taking notes today, here's all the notes I want you to take. Somewhere write these words down. Love one another. Say that with me. Love one another. We'll keep coming back to this throughout the day, but if you're taking notes, love one another. Anything else you add to this will be fine, but this is the point. This is what the day is about. And I want to begin by taking you to the northern bank of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. And you're looking into a fishing village there. It's the fishing village of Peter and Andrew, but especially of James and John. This is a column that was found in Capernaum. And if you can read Hebrew, you'll notice that it says, Alphaeus, the son of Zebedee, the son of John, made this column. May it be for him a blessing. This was a donation to the city. It was made by the family of Zebedee. It might be a name that you're familiar with from the Bible, because what we know is Zebedee had two sons. One named John, 
the other named James, they were fishermen. And so, one day, Jesus came and said, leave that life, drop your nets, and come and follow me, and I'll teach you how to fish for people. And what we discover is that John and his brother James left their dad and the servants and the nets, and they went on a journey to follow after Jesus. Can you imagine just dropping what you're doing? In the middle of tax season, Jesus comes by and says, hey, I'm ready for you to follow me. And you're like, I'm good. I'm out of here, right? Uh, maybe they were ready for what's next. But what we know is that whenever you leave something that you've always done, there is this fear, right? The butterflies, the anticipation, the unknown. And John and James follow Jesus into this life. And Mark tells us a little bit about these first band of followers of Jesus. But what's interesting is that we only learn a little bit more about a few of them. So notice what it says. These are the twelve he appointed to be apostles, first followers of him. Simon, he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave a name as well. He called them Boanerges. In Aramaic, this means sons of thunder. What does it mean to be a son of thunder? Think about that for a minute. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, who would later betray him. So three of the twelve get nicknames. Peter, he's called Rocky, and James and John. They're called the sons of thunder. What does it mean to be a son of thunder? Here at the bottom, I argue, it means that you're a hothead or you're angry. The word that's used by Jesus in Aramaic was this word rahama, which means wrath. Or thunder. These were the ones that could really get angry fast. Have you ever met anybody like that? What's funny is, is that I meet people like that often when I'm fishing. You know, when uh, the line breaks and I hear expletives come flying from the boat, or when uh, the bait that you put on there just uh, falls into the sea and you hear expletives by somebody who's there. And you spend your time on the sea and you get a little cranky and you get a little uh, upset with others who try to take your honey holes, the best place to fish. This is where my family's fished. This is where my father fished. This is where his father fished. What are you doing in my spot? And you can understand pretty quickly how these two could be called sons of thunder. They're ready for a fight. And we all know somebody like that. And what's interesting is that when I was in high school, there was a part of me that was like that. I'm the middle of three. I was a linebacker and a guard. I wrestled. I looked for a fight often. It was just part of being a kid growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Did any of the rest of you grow up that way? A little rough around the edges? Not too afraid to pick a fight? Surely going to stand up for yourself? If you're going to have to go behind the school and Settle this a different way. You sure didn't mind doing it. That's James. That's John. They're the sons of thunder. But they drop their nets and they journey with Jesus. And things begin to change. But here's the truth about the apostle John when he began to follow Jesus. You ready? Look at these words. He wrote them about 60 years later. They're found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. 
He says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is actually a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and their sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And God has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. John says, you can't claim to love God if you hate people. If there's somebody that you don't love, that somebody is God. And so what we discover about John, the hothead, the son of thunder, was that he was a young man filled with anger. We can even say he was a young man that was filled with hate. And because John wrote these words himself 60 years later, we can even say that when he began to follow after Jesus, he did not, according to his own words, love God. Because hate lived in his heart. And there was a day when we saw this hate rise to its highest level. Let's read about it. It says in the Gospel of Luke, And Jesus sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans. We pretty much know who the Samaritans are, but just to remind each other, Samaritans were those who originally were Jewish, who during the exile in 721 B.C. were left behind and didn't go to Babylon and intermarried with other tribes that weren't Jewish. And so Samaritan means half-breed. Kind of Jewish, kind of not Jewish. Set up their own scriptures, just the first five books, worshipped on their own hill, lived in their own little enclave. And Jesus was passing through there and sent messengers ahead to make preparations, i.e., go to the grocery store and buy some food. But the people wouldn't receive him because they always asked this question. You're passing through, where are you headed? And if you said, I'm headed to the temple, I'm headed to Jerusalem, then they wouldn't give you any food because their argument was, the temple is right here. It's right there on the top of our mountain. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. This is the true place. This all makes sense if you remember John 4 and Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. So they wouldn't feed Jesus or his band. They refused them service. One of the things that we'll celebrate this weekend is the life of a man named Martin Luther King who knew exactly what it was like to go into a city and not be able to get a a meal. To not know what it was like to stay in a hotel. To be turned away from service. And of course, Martin Luther King, drawing upon the words of Jesus, says that you have to answer hate with love. And brute force with soul force. But what we discover about James and about John is that they were no Martin Luther King at this point. This is what the people of Samaria look like today. We think there are about 800. Last time I checked, there were 776 Samaritans left in the world. Uh, They're kind of like the Amish. Uh, Children can opt in or opt out. They still sacrifice on the top of their mountain there in the middle of Jerusalem, there's still a group of people called the Samaritans even to this day. But what James and John wanted to do, it tells us in Luke 9, is that when Jesus' disciples, James and John, saw that they were being refused service, 
they turned to Jesus and said these words, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? What were they asking? Can we wipe these people out? We would do this a whole lot more nicely today. We'd probably use a drone or something. But they're saying, can't we just wipe them off the face of the earth? Can't we just do away with them? Remember, this is John whose heart is filled with hate. And now we see it all spill out. In his anger, he's ready to call for genocide of an entire race of people. The rest of the text says, But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Those may not seem like big, significant words to you, but they're very big and significant words to me. Can I tell you why? Because my other job is in higher ed. And in higher education today, you live with the fear that you're going to say the wrong thing, and the day you do, you're going to be shunned. And what this text tells us is that Jesus turned and rebuked them and then they went on to another village. And if you begin to understand what would happen to James and John in our world today, is that they would be ostracized. They would be cut out from the group. There would be no place for them anymore because they had dared to say the wrong thing. That's the world we live in today. And there is great power in virtue signaling, in cutting other people off so that you can show how much more virtuous you are by cutting them off. Was what James and John did absolutely wrong? Was it totally displeasing to the way of God? Yeah. But what we notice about Jesus is that from this point on, he pulls... John closer. He looks at John and thinks, you don't understand who I am. You've missed the whole point. You don't get it. And so as we begin to look at the rest of the gospel, what we discover is that Jesus spends more time with John. He becomes one of the three that Jesus spends more time with than anyone else. He's one of the three on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus speaks with Moses and Elijah. John saw Jesus up close and personal with people. When he writes his gospel, it's not like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's all about Jesus and people. And what is it like when Jesus and people intersect? And he begins to take notes and to pay attention to this one who's talking about a new way of life and a new kingdom. And when you come to John chapter 13, John writes these words. He says, When Jesus knew his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Paying attention to Jesus, he began to realize what love looked like. In John 13, he takes us to the upper room. This is what the upper room looks like today. It's the site where the upper room was. This is a rebuild of it in the uh, Middle Ages. But if you could picture this as the place where Jesus and his disciples gathered for that final meal, what you would want to sketch in, and many of you would do it far better than I did, is you'd want to sketch in a stool, a basin, and a towel. Because what happened is everybody walked up the stairs and into this banquet hall. 
And right there as they walked in, there was a stool. And there was a basin. And there was a towel. But what was missing was the servant. The one who would wash each of their feet as they made their way up for the meal wasn't there. And so each of the apostles then had a dilemma. Do I stop and wash feet? And if I sit on that stool to wash my feet, you know what I'm going to end up getting to do, don't you? I'm going to sit on this stool and wash everybody's feet. I'll be stuck here until the very last, and then I'll get the worst seat at the meal. And so everybody just walks by, and with feet that have been walking through dung and all of the other nastiness, they just come walking in and they sit down to eat. And before you think, well, we're up here eating and feet are down there, you got to understand that the tables at the time of Jesus were about this high. And you ate leaning on your left elbow with your feet kind of dangling behind the person next to you. And so the upper room smelled like a locker room after a football game. And then Jesus got up. And what John writes is that he took off his outer clothing, he stripped down to his boxers, and he put a towel around his waist. And then he did what none of them were willing to do. He began to wash feet. And it was so quiet in that room. Because everybody was thinking, he shouldn't be doing that. I should be doing it. And as you contemplate this story, and you picture Jesus making his way around, you know Peter has something to say. But what I want you to notice is that as Jesus is washing feet, he washes the feet of the one who would soon betray him. He washes the feet of the one who would soon deny him. He washes the feet of the ten who would soon abandon him. And then after he's washed their feet... He puts back on his robe. He takes his place at the head of the table. And he asks the question, Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher, you call me Lord. And you're right. That's who I am. So now, if I, your teacher and your Lord, have washed your feet, just understand... I did it as an example for you that you ought to wash the feet of others also. Jesus says that everything I have done, now it's your turn. And he closes off this section by saying, now that you know what you ought to do, the blessing comes in doing it. And then a few verses later, we read these words. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the way you need to love one another. Is with the standard of the way that I have loved you. Now it's your turn to love one another. By this, this, this is the way that the whole world will know that you're my disciples. By the way that you love one another. In a world where God is unseen, the way to see God 
is in the way that you love one another. The rest of the story, John was there that night in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus prayed. John witnessed Jesus at the cross. The truth about John the Apostle is that Jesus changed his heart. People do change when Jesus gets hold of their heart. A young man who was angry, who was filled with hate, who didn't know how to love God, Jesus changed his heart. Because John met the one who had love in his eyes. And so here we come to the old man John. Now 90 AD, some 60 years later, and he writes these words. What manner of love it is that the Father has lavished upon us that we can be called children of God. But that is who we are. God has loved us so much we get to be called children. And then he says, so we ought to love not just with our words but with our actions. We ought to love by the way that we treat other people. And then he comes to the text that we close with today. Dear friends, let us love one another. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love. He sent his son into the world that we might live through him. Last week I said our first essential is to love God. But what we notice is that John says that you can't claim to love God if you don't love your brother. So our first essential and our fourth essential are tied to each other. If you're going to love God, you've got to love people. All God's people. This is love, John says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. Since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But when we love each other, his love is made complete in us. The closest thing people will see to the presence of God is when you love the way that Jesus loved. So, the old man of Ephesus, he's approaching 100 years old. People come from all over Turkey to come and hear him speak because they know his days are numbered. And these are John's famous last words. When John was an old man in Ephesus, he had to be carried to the church in the arms of his disciples. And at these meetings, he was accustomed to say no more than little children love one another. I wish the Apostle John had preached this sermon instead of Sager. It would have been a whole lot shorter. <laughs> little children love one another. The young man filled with hate becomes known as the Apostle of Love. ...in his old age, because Jesus changes hearts. After a time, the disciples wearied at always hearing the same words. And so they asked, Master, why do you always say the same thing? And his reply was, it is the Lord's command. And if this alone be done, it will be enough. Love one another and all the other loves will flow out of that. So John gets the last word. Little children love one another. And if you need a visual for what that will look like in your life this week, here's your visual for what it would be for you to love one another. All of this doesn't begin with you. It begins with God, who loved you so much that he sent Jesus into this world to show it and left the Holy Spirit behind to remind you of this love again and again and again. 
If you haven't surrendered to the love of Christ, that's what baptism is. It's, it's a surrendering. It's a giving over of everything you are to the love of God and asking Jesus to fill your life and to forgive you of your sin. For the rest of us, let's recommit that we are going to be people who lead with love in our relationships with others. However we can minister to you, we invite you to the front as we stand and sing together.